Hello again, it's Tom here with my final video presentation for the advanced medical care topic in the Charles Sturt University uh, Graduate Diploma of Paramedicine course. This week uh, I'm discussing the topic of seizures and paramedic management. We're just going to first have a look at normal neuronal activity, a quick uh, just uh, discussion on what a seizure is. We're going to look at the epidemiology of epilepsy and seizures, how we're going to assess and classify seizures, the pathophysiology behind seizures, how we're going to manage them, uh, the specific pharmacology behind a couple of drugs and of course uh, just a reference list at the end. Before we discuss what goes wrong I thought it'd be wise to revise what goes right. So I'll go over how a neuron normally works. So first of all, we'll look at the anatomy of a neuron. And this is an illustration of a, of a multipolar neuron. Uh, and the major anatomy of that is, is highlighted here. So first of all, the cell body, which is also known as the soma, contains the nucleus, which is surrounded by a rough endoplasmic reticulum, uh, a number of uh, mitochondria, as well as uh, some Golgi apparatuses as well. Now let's just remember that uh, the rough endoplasmic reticulum plays an important role in protein synthesis, uh, which can be used for intracellular uh, neurotransmitter production, for example. Meanwhile, the Golgi apparatus, which is similar to an endoplasmic reticulum in its structure, um, can produce hormones and is involved in putting the final touches uh, on, on the protein synth synthesis process. Now, if you imagine the neuronal cell body as a network router, for example, the dendrites act as the Ethernet cable that's bringing data into the neuron. Now, dendrite is a Greek word meaning tree, uh, which I think helps visualize kind of what's going on here. Um, the dendrites are kind of short and highly branched extensions of the neuronal body, uh, and they have an interface with the axon terminals of other neurons with which they form a synapse. So where the dendrite is the input cable into the network router, that is the neuronal cell body, the axon is the output cable uh, connecting the neuronal cell to other neurons or other cells. So the axon itself emerges at the axon hillock on the neuronal body and functions to conduct information from the cell body to the nerve terminal. The axon branches into teledendria, which is a Greek word for end of the tree, and they kind of look like roots, which you can kind of see there on the screen. So each root, or teledendron, uh, has an axon terminal, which forms a synapse with the dendrite of another neuron. The synapse is essentially the joint or meeting place of two neurons. Now, stored within the axon terminal, uh, are some things called the synaptic vesicles and those vesicles contain the neurotransmitters that communicate with other neurons or cells. So there are two types of neurons, there's unmyelinated and myelinated. We see here on this uh, image to the right that there's uh, some some Schwann cells um, highlighted by the uh, along the axon there. Schwann cells are found in the peripheral nervous system only, and they wrap around the axon of a neuron and they produce the myelin sheath. Uh, and each Schwann cell is only capable of myelate, myelinating one neuron. Meanwhile, oligodendrocytes are found in the central nervous system, and these are glial cells that, that sit between the axons, which unlike the neuron, uh, unlike the Schwann cells, which wrap around the axon, and they can the oligodendrocytes can myelinate up to about 50 uh, axons per uh, oligodendrocyte cell. So we've mentioned that both Schwann cells and oligodendrocytes produce something called the myelin sheath. And let's just quickly revise what that, that does. The sheath itself is a fatty sectioned layer that surrounds the axon. Uh, it acts to insulate the axon as well as increases the distance between the extracellular cations uh, 
and sodium that enters the axon at the nodes of Ranvier. And in doing so, it reduces their repulsive forces and allows quicker transmission of an action potential. Now, the nodes of Ranvier are the gaps in between the sections of the myelin sheath. They are rich in ion channels and they're exposed to the extracellular space, which means that they can quickly ch exchange ions needed to generate or continue an action potential. So essentially the action potential jumps from node to node along the myelin sheath. So together, the generation of myelin and the nodes of Ranvier from Schwann cells or oligodendrocytes allow for the extremely fast conduction of an action potential from the soma and along the axon until it reaches the axon terminal. And this phenomenon is known, known as salter tree conduction. So let's look at the actual action potential itself. So there are typically five stages of uh, neuronal uh, action potential progression. At rest, the intracellular charge of the neutron is negative and it sits around minus 70 millivolts. There's a higher concentration of potassium within the cell than outside. Inversely, there's a lower intracellular concentration of sodium than in the extracellular space. So a stimulation causes the opening of sodium channels, which results in the influx of sodium ions and the beginning of the rising or depolarization phase. Potassium is freely moving in and out of the cell at this space um, through passive leak channels and the movement of ions uh, in this early phase is both due to the imbalance of their concentration gradients and also due to the attraction of opposite charges. The movement of sodium results in an increase in the intracellular charge away from the resting membrane potential. Now it's important to note that if the charge in the net charge is less than threshold, then the potassium efflux will overwhelm the sodium influx, causing the charge to decline back towards the resting potential. And this is represented uh, on the graph here uh, by the failed initiations. Uh, so this is essentially known as the all or none principle, which basically says that the ionic permeability of the neuron does not change unless the threshold is met. So essentially an action potential can't be generated unless the threshold is met. The, the peak and repolarization phase begins once the charge reaches around a positive 40 uh, millivolts. Sodium influx here has peaked and the sodium ion channels close and as a result the sodium influx stops. However, this lowers the neuron's permeability when compared to potassium. As such, the potassium rapidly exits the cell, causing repolarization. And because of the movement of potassium, the charge returns towards, or starts heading back towards the resting membrane potential. So during the fourth phase, uh, repolarization finishes and after, after potential or hyperpolarization occurs. Here, voltage-gated sodium channels are completely closed, but potassium continues to leave the cell, resulting in a membrane potential which is slightly lower than resting. Finally, uh, the, the fifth, fifth, fifth phase occurs, and here the voltage-gated potassium channels close, which stops potassium efflux and restores the neuron to resting membrane potential. And this process continues whenever a stimulus uh, causes threshold to be overcome. To note something called the refractory period, which is divided into the absolute and relative refractory periods. During the absolute refractory period, no further action potential can be generated. Typically, the absolute refractory period lasts from the beginning of the depolarization or rising phase until near the end of the repolarization phase. However, during the relative refractory period, stimuli can, can cause an action potential, but only if it is significantly large enough to exceed threshold. And this graph on the left here uh, relates the refractory period to 
the action potential waveform itself. What's a seizure then? Well, a seizure is loosely described as an excessive electrical discharge from a group of cells within the brain. Seizures are in the majority of cases involuntarily, involuntary usually, uh, but I'll discuss why this isn't always the case later on. There's many causes uh, for seizures, including these on the screen here, which is your epilepsy, your head injury, hypoxia, intoxication or the uh, ingestion of toxins, uh, hypoglycemia and uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, hyperthermia, uh, cerebrovascular accident or intracranial hemorrhage, and electrolyte imbalances are some causes of seizures. We'll mostly focus on epilepsy in this presentation. So let's discuss the epidemiology of epilepsy. Epilepsy is a chronic brain disease. It's not a mental illness. It's defined as recurrent episodes of involuntary movement or loss of consciousness, which make up the symptoms of a seizure that are unprovoked. So that means that it's not as a result of another pathology, such as a stroke or electrolyte imbalance, intoxication, or head injury, for example. There's around 50 million people around the world who are diagnosed with epilepsy. It's more common and less effectively treated in developing countries. And these patients also tend to have a lower life expectancy and often face stigma around the disorder. Approximately three to three and a half percent of Australians will experience epilepsy at some point in their lives. And there's currently about 250,000 Australians living with epilepsy. Epileptic patients have a two to three times increased risk of death when compared to non-epileptic patients. They also tend to experience uh, social, psychological and physical consequences. Obviously, this is quite dependent on the severity of their condition, but things like employment, driving, sports and entertainment can be limited by the condition. One third of epilepsy disorders are due to genetic differences, and this is thought to be around um, the genetic mutations with ion channels. Around 25% of epileptic cases are due to lesions, which is a nice kind of medical word, which basically means a whoopsie. So think uh, tumours or infarcted tissue or structural abnormalities uh, to the brain which uh, have then subsequently caused an epileptic condition. But there's still a significant portion of epilepsy that's due to an unknown cause. How do you assess or classify seizures? Well, there's been a number of different classifications and terms used over the years to define and categorise seizures. In 2010, the phrases generalized or partial referring to the amount of the body that was impacted and simple or complex referring to the level of consciousness during the seizure event we used. Uh, these terms were introduced to replace uh, the previous terms which were I believe coined in the 80s um, and the terms we used were grand mal and petty mal. However in 2017 the very uh, action hero sounding International League Against Epilepsy Commission on the classification and terminology of uh, epilepsy revised the terms again. So we've got a new updated uh, set of phrases to learn. Seizure types are now based on the initial manifestation of the seizure and referred to as generalized, which means that seizures originate at some point within or rapidly engage bilaterally distributed networks of the brain. And they are further broken down into motor and non-motor seizures, where non-motor refers to the various types of absent seizures. Or there are now focal seizures, which has replaced the partial term to describe epilepsy associated with seizures that involve one hemisphere of the brain only. They're also broken down into motor and non-motor, but focal seizures are a little bit more complex. They're also subdivided into levels of awareness, which is displayed throughout the seizure. So someone with a focal seizure can be aware of what's going on. They can have an impaired awareness 
or it's unknown if they're aware during their seizure. Finally, there's also an unknown onset, which uh, basically is used if the start of the seizure is not witnessed or they can't exactly establish when the seizure itself starts. A seizure that begins focally but then spreads to a generalised seizure is referred to as a focal to bilateral tonic-clonic seizure. And that's actually a, a pretty common presentation for tonic-clonic seizures. If we look uh, on this screen here, there's some examples of specific types of seizures that fall under the aforementioned terms. Some to focus and some that will probably come across uh, uh, tonic-clonic, which is a generalised seizure where there is both strong muscle tone, which is the tonic part, and sustained rhythmic involuntary jerking movement of the limbs. You can also have a simply tonic seizure, which is just a generalised seizure where there is involuntary strong muscle tone. But likewise, you can also have a simply clonic generalised seizure, which is where you get that jerking of the limbs only. That's also different to a myoclonic seizure, which is kind of like a muscle spasmic seizure, uh, which is a bit different to the jerking motions that you'll see in a tonic-clonic or a clonic seizure. So for the rest of the presentation, we'll mostly focus on uh, generalised tonic-clonic seizures since they're the most common that we'll come across. So let's just quickly revise what the symptoms are of a generalised tonic-clonic seizure. As we mentioned before, you get that tone or stiffness of the muscles. There's that clinicity, which is the rhythmic shaking or jerking of limbs. And this is usually fine, uh, fine movements, not large, gross movements away from the body. And it's usually synchronised in that both sides of the body are doing the same thing at the same time. There's a loss of consciousness. Often patients will present with a tachycardia, hypertension. They will have uh, episodes of apnea or they'll be apneic or they'll have irregular intermittent respirations. They will become hypoxemic due to the apnea. They often are incontinent. There can be lip or tongue biting as well as trismus and diaphoresis, which is your profound sweating. Patients often become um, pallid or cyanotic as, as a result of uh, their irregular uh, respiration or apnea and also due to their increased metabolic demand uh, and that mismatch between oxygen supply and demand. So just quickly, what is status epilepticus? Well, status epilepticus is a medical emergency that paramedics are likely to encounter in their careers. It's defined as a persistent seizure activity that is not likely to stop spontaneously. Previously, we've had other definitions that have uh, included uh, uh, phrases such as 30 minutes of continuous seizure activity or uh, two or more seizures without full recovery in between. As far as I'm aware, there isn't a uh, kind of globally accepted definition for status epile epilepticus, so it's any of those kind of three. The one to really to be quite concerned about is the generalised convulsive status epilepticus, or GCSE, and for those here watching in England, it's got nothing to do with your uh, schooling there. Um, this is a medical emergency that requires intervention from emergency medical personnel GCSE can be tonic-clonic, it can be tonic, it can be clonic, or it can be myoclonic in its presentation, as well as it can evolve during the course of the episode. So it can start as tonic-clonic and move into myoclonic or tone only. This uh, change um, towards more subtle symptoms of seizure activity can be referred to as end-stage status epilepticus. Going to assess uh, the epileptic patient. Now, this handsome chap here is uh, Bill, who's also in this course. Um, he has, as you can see, quite a wide set jaw. He's got a, it's a very strong jaw. Um, he's you know, a handsome chap, but not the tallest fella. So you know, you win some, you lose some, I suppose. Uh, 
Um, this is quite a quite a good photo of Bill, I think. I quite like it. Also, eyelashes are on point there, mate. So good good work with that. I hope your mascara is treating you well. Uh, paramedic assessment of seizures. Safety, as with everything else that we do, is the primary concern. In the seizing patient, we need to ensure uh, their safety by moving the patient uh, if they're in a, in a dangerous position, or um, if we can't do that, or if it's just easier, we should just remove dangerous objects in the environment around them to reduce the risk of secondary injuries. Uh, I shouldn't have to say this because people that are watching this should be paramedics and you know, above, uh, or at least had some first aid training in the recent uh, recent years, but you still hear it from time to time. Um, you don't put anything in the mouth of a seizing patient because they can get a worsened airway obstruction from it. There's if they're, they're going to bite their tongue, they're going to bite their tongue. After their safety, uh, our primary concern really in shot in, involves ensuring a patient airway, and I'll touch more on that a bit later on. Oxygenation is important uh, to keep an eye on uh, as patients often have that in ineffective respirations during seizure episodes this may trigger an intervention earlier if your ventilation and oxygenation are severely compromised but uh, it's also important to remember that a blood glucose level is important to obtain uh, as diabetics can have seizures if they're hypoglycemic and likewise pro prolonged seizure activity can also uh, induce a hypoglycemic episode so once we're happy that the patient's safe and we've assessed, we can assess the duration and the frequency of the patient's episode today and in recent times. If the patient's been seizing for greater than five minutes, then intervene. Uh, and we'll discuss how to do that later on. Otherwise, see if the seizure will self-resolve. Uh, self um, regardless of if you've had to stop the seizure or if it's self-terminated, we need to establish how many seizures the patient's had today is this potentially a status epilepticus event that we need to manage a little bit differently than an isolated seizure, for example? We also need to find out the patient's normal seizure history and establish if anything is abnormal. So first we need to establish if they have a, a seizure history at all. If no, then we need to be quite concerned about what the acute cause for a seizure is. And obviously transport to ED is, is pretty well mandated in this event. However, if the patient does have a seizure history, we need to figure out if this is a normal presentation for them or is something out of the ordinary here. If this is normal for them, perhaps we consider not transporting them um, unless we've got concerns about something else. So we need to investigate whether there's been recent medication changes, for example, or even if medications have been ceased. Uh, or one of the other important things to check is if the patient's actually been compliant in taking their medications as, as prescribed. Has the patient complained of any prodromal symptoms that aren't normal, like infective symptoms or shortness of breath? We also need to consider if there's a different underlying pathology that could have triggered an atypical seizure presentation and the risk this might have for more frequent seizures than expected. Uh, so that's why we need to really quite thoroughly assess them. Are there observations suggestive of something more sinister? Also, let's consider what the patient was doing at the time of their seizure. Were they drinking? Were they being physically active? Were they watching something that could trigger a photosensitive seizure episode? And is any of that abnormal for them? So let's go into the pathophysiology now and let's just have a look at what triggers a seizure. As discussed before, a seizure is the physical manifestation of uh, paroxysmal excessive excitatory discharges from a group of neurons. The word paroxysmal means episodic or intermittent. In epilepsy, it's currently unknown what precisely triggers the rapid depolarization of neurons, but when this occurs, we've noticed something called a paroxysmal depolarizing shift follows, meaning that neighboring neurons also fire off. For a seizure to occur, we need three conditions to be met. The first is that we need to have a group of pathologically excitatory neurons. We need to increase uh, the excitatory connections to the spread the discharge of uh, those excitatory neurons. And that's usually facilitated through the glutamate and uh, NMDA pathway 
And we also need to reduce the inhibitory projections of neurons, which is usually along the GABAergic pathway. So there's essentially an imbalance of excitatory versus inhibitory pathways in neurons. But there may also be an imbalance of excitatory, especially the glutamate and NMDA molecules, as well as inhibitory, especially your GABAergic neurotransmitters. There's also an enhanced excitatory capacity uh, of the neurons implicated in seizure activity. We've also noticed that there could be uh, abnormal voltage-gated sodium channels that can, can uh, encourage the inward flow of, of sodium. There can also be an alteration of intra- and extracellular ionic concentrations that are more enabling of depolarization and action potential propagation as well. It's thought that uh, the multiple repeated synchronized um, subthreshold stimuli, so those um, failed initiations that we were looking at in the action potential slide at the beginning of the presentation. So we're saying that there's multiple repeated um, initiations that are synchronized together, essentially add together to overcome the threshold required for an action potential to occur. And this is known as temporal summation. So let's have a look at what actually happens during a generalized seizure. It's thought that most generalized seizures have a focal origin which spreads across the brain due to the paroxysmal depolarizing shift that we just discussed. In fact, the symptoms of an aura that are experienced by many epileptics are actually considered a focal seizure itself. Now, some research suggests that there can be small bursts of neuronal seizure activity around a focal lesion uh, days before an actual seizure occurs, which suggests that this might actually be a self-perpetuating condition where small episodes of seizure activity change the electrophysiology of the brain, which ultimately crescendos into a symptomatic seizure. And this can kind of explain why some patients experience prodromal symptoms, sometimes days before experiencing an aura or even the generalized seizure itself. In the context of a generalized seizure, an uninhibited cortical excitation in one hemisphere of the brain can spread to the adjacent and contralateral cortex using interhemispherical pathways. And this is when we begin to see the first symptoms of a seizure. So that's when we start to see the loss of consciousness, we'll start to see the tonicity, which is the increased muscle tone or the tonic part of a tonic-clonic seizure. We'll start to see the autonomic nervous system activation, specifically the sympathetic nervous system, where we'll see tachycardia, madriasis, and hypertension, as well as seeing respiratory arrest. As excitation spreads, at some point the diencephalon attempts to inhibit the process of this spread. Just a reminder that the diencephalon is the posterior aspect of the forebrain containing all parts of the thalamus and the third ventricle. And by all parts of the thalamus, I mean parts like the epithalamus and the hypothalamus. Uh, the diencephalon works to relay sensory information to different parts of the brain. And as a result of it trying to stop those, uh, stop the, the um, spread of seizure activity, we'll start to see intermittent bursts of clonic activity, which is that shaking part of the seizure. So really when we start seeing someone uh, having that tonic movement, that jerking, that is actually a part of the brain trying to stop the seizure from happening. After a while, the tonic-clonic activity will begin to fade out and become less frequent. At this point, the focal neurons involved in the seizure activity can become paralyzed. Now, magnetic resonance imaging performed at this time shows that there is an increased permeability of the blood-brain barrier, as well as regional edema in parts of the brain. Now, it's thought that this is what causes the post-ictal stupor, the sensory loss, the aphasia, the hemianopia, and headache that we see in patients uh, whilst they're recovering after having a seizure episode. It's also thought that uh, this could be the cause for the post-ictal stroke mimic known as Todd's paralysis. Now in the context of status epilepticus, the disruption of the blood-brain barrier uh, allows the, uh, potassium and albumin into the central nervous system, both of which worsen neuronal hyperexcitability. And as a result of that, they, uh, we also see 
that seizure activity continues into end stage status epilepticus, which results in the increased expression of uh, NMDA and glutamine receptors, which lowers the threshold for seizures to occur. So the longer we seize, the more sensitive we become to propagating a seizure action potential. After about 20 minutes of seizure activity, we'll begin to see other symptoms like hypotension, hypoxemia, uh, hypoglycemia, metabolic acidosis, hyperthermia. We'll also see things like dysrhythmias and rhabdomyolysis. We can even see pulmonary edema. After about two hours, uh, neurotoxic amino acids will cause neuronal necrosis and apoptosis. Due to the hyperexcitability at this stage, our anticonvulsant therapies can become less effective as well, making control of, control of the uh, seizure activity even more difficult. Now, I did mention something before, uh, a bit earlier on in the presentation, about not all seizures being related to excessive neuronal excitability. So let's just have a quick chat about non-epileptic seizures because this is something that I seem to come across fairly often in clinical practice. So the old term that you still hear in frequent use for this is something called a pseudo seizure. And an even older term for that, which I have not heard used, uh, is something called a hysterical seizure. Now clinically, psychogenic seizures can uh, mimic epileptic seizures, but there's no excessive neuronal activity. And instead there's a psychological underpinning um, that is manifesting as physical symptoms. So as we said, we've got these old phrases. Sometime in recent years, someone or some group of people decided to change the name to psychogenic non-epileptic seizure, which is fine when you say all of the words separately. However, <laughs> when you try to say it as an acronym or even by saying the initial letters themselves, so PNES, or if you try to just say PNES, uh, it really does sound incredibly similar to a part of anatomy. Um, I, I don't know why they didn't just use the phrase non-epileptic psychogenic seizure or NEPS because it's it, it's just easier and doesn't like try saying you've got PNES to a patient. It just doesn't. Yeah. Anyway, um, there's been various studies uh, of inpatient admissions and outpatient referrals. And they kind of quote that anywhere from five to 40% of suspected epilepsy cases have an eventual diagnosis of non-epileptic seizures. Epidemiologically, they're most often seen in females, which is consistent with the rates um, uh, or, the, or, so the, or the epidemiology of conversion disorders in general. Uh, and its onset uh, of episodes uh, tends to be around the third decade of, uh, decade of life. Uh, but really any age or gender can be affected or can um, present with uh, non-epileptic seizures. While the name is a bit silly, the, you know, you know, I've made some jokes about the, the name uh, that they've decided to give it. Um, it's pretty important to note that while there's actually a, you know, a very, very small amount of people who do pretend to have seizures, to patients with psychogenic non-epileptic seizures and to their families, the symptoms that they present with can seem very real, real and, uh, and distressing indeed. Therefore, it's important to acknowledge the distress that underlines this condition, as well as the distress that the condition itself can bring. It's important for paramedics to make sure that they don't um, outwardly diagnose patients with this unless there's really, really significant evidence to prove that this is what's going on. Because sometimes, as we've said, you know, there's the a significant percentage of patients that are referred by medical officers to neurology outpatient appointments or admitted uh, to neurology wards that end up getting diagnosed with this. Um, and, it, and like all kind of mental health conditions, it really can be more of a diagnosis of exclusion than, uh, than anything else. Having said that, there are a number of symptoms that we can use to differentiate a non-epileptic seizure from that of a true epileptic seizure. Often 
non-epileptic seizures, you'll see patients will have their eyes closed, um, and that's not that common in true epileptic seizures. Often non-epileptic patients will be atonic. Atonia means that they're lacking in tone, so this would mean that they will have seizure movements that do not have that typical stiffness that we see in tonic-clonic seizures. Interestingly, psychogenic seizures are nearly always witnessed by someone else and rarely occur, occur during sleep or when the patient's by themselves. There's usually a very distinct lack of autonomic symptoms seen in epileptic seizures, so you don't tend to see the tachycardia and hypertension madriasis that we mentioned in non-epileptic seizures. Another interesting note is that uh, non-epileptic patients tend to return to baseline quite quickly once the seizure activity is stopped. Uh, so they either have no or a very brief prostictal period, which isn't really consistent with having had a epileptic seizure. Non-epileptic patients also tend to display rapid shallow respirations uh, immediately after their seizure activity compared to the deep and prolonged respirations that we tend to see in the postictal phase of a tonic-clonic seizure. Whilst the seizure activity, like we mentioned, lacks tone, they also tend to be asynchronous, which means that they don't really have that jerking movement in harmony, so their limbs don't move or, or um, tremor yeah, um, together like we see in a true tonic-clonic seizure. Additionally, sometimes those movements themselves can be quite grand or extreme compared to typical seizure movement. And it can include things like thrashing and rolling around, pelvic thrusts, um, and even epistotonic um, posturing, which if you go and watch my video on poisoning, you'll see a good uh, painting of what epistotonus is. Some non-epileptic seizure episodes can also be accompanied by, like, uh, by vocalizations like whimpering or crying or weeping or even um, specific emotive words. Uh, and that's not seen in epileptic seizures. You can um, hear some vocalizations in a epileptic seizure, but this usually is uh, isolated to the onset of the seizure itself. And they tend to be quite guttural sounds. Uh, and that's usually because the air is forcefully pushed out of the chest um, by the tonicity of the seizure. Non-epileptic uh, seizure episodes tend to occur more often than, than most tonic-clonic epileptic patients. Um, and they also tend to have a longer duration. You know, they can last for up to 30 minutes when realistically most seizure cases uh, will, will self-terminate in a couple of minutes. And finally, non-epileptic non seizure patients will tend to have an incomplete loss of awareness during episodes. So this can be evidenced by a response to stimuli whilst they're supposedly seizing or recollection of the patient um, of events during the episode. Obviously, for a generalized seizure to occur, the patient has to be unconscious. To the management of seizures. So we'll just quickly talk about the general principles first, and we'll start with our ABCs. So with the airway, we don't really need to start actively managing the airway during a seizure unless there are clear signs of obstruction or the seizure is prolonged and ventilation is problematic. Remember, like we said, uh, during the seizure, especially a generalized seizure, a patient is likely to be apneic or at least have quite irregular and ultimately quite ineffective um, respiration. So this can be tolerated for a little while. So this is really where the time side of things becomes more important. So it's a good recommendation to position the patient on their side, you know, if then that kind of recovery position, if it's possible whilst they're seizing. But airway management is also quite important in the postictal or sedated patient. So if we are intervening with the patient's airway, let's consider the least invasive airway adjunct possible. So if we can get away with simple air, airway maneuvers, such as um, you know, posturing and uh, chin lifts, um, that would be ideal. But even if we have to insert a device, maybe just try using a nasopharyngeal airway as that doesn't, or is less likely to cause a gag reflex, which can be problematic as the patient's GCS improves in the postictal phase.
or alternatively as their sedation starts to wear off. With breathing, consider oxygen, uh, especially if the patient's uh, saturations are low, but bear in mind that that's most likely due to the irregular respiration rate and apnea. Um, if the patient isn't self-ventilating during their seizure, then oxygen is probably not going to do all that much. It's important to monitor the patient's ECG uh, during seizure activity, especially in the patient that's got no known seizure activity. I was actually really annoyed. Uh, there, there was a good video that I saw a couple of years ago that was on YouTube of a patient that was undergoing a video um, electroencephalogram um, to investigate their seizures. And they're also connected to an ECG at the same time. And what they thought was an, uh, an epileptic presentation was actually a cardiac presentation and the patient would go into torsades and then in, uh, into cardiac arrest uh, and then uh, spontaneously revert but during that process of dysrhythmia she was having hypoxic seizures and not a true uh, epileptic seizure so it's important to monitor the patient's ECG and and uh, you know during and after the seizure activity obviously artifact would be a bit of an issue whilst they're seizing but it's, we need to remember that uh, dysrhythmias can cause hypoxic seizures and may go undiagnosed if it's not captured. Typically uh, circulatory issues themselves uh, are not common in seizure patients uh, unless of course the seizure is due to a circulatory pathology itself uh, but like we did mention before in the end stage uh, status epilepticus patients you may start to see hypotension Otherwise, it's important to treat reversible causes, uh, especially, you know, we need to identify and manage them if they're present. Hypoglycemia, like we mentioned earlier, can cause seizures and will be best rectified by the correction of blood glucose level. Likewise, if um, the patient's been seizing for quite some time and they've developed a hypoglycemia as a result, that can also be propagating the seizure activity. So let's uh, get on top of that. Uh, as we've mentioned, uh, hypoxemia can cause uh, seizures if it's unabated. Uh, and likewise, um, dysrhythmias and hyperthermia um, can uh, also cause seizures. So let's have a look at uh, the pharmacology of some medications. Uh, this list here is an example of first, second, and third line agents that are used to control seizures. I'll only focus on one of each tier which, uh, which seem to be used in ambulance services already. Pharmacological management of seizures. Benzos are considered the first line agents for anticonvulsive therapy. Uh, and so they are most frequently used first to stop seizures. Benzodiazepines, uh, kind of mistakenly known as agonists of GABA, which is not 100% correct. They are actually positive allosteric modulators, which means that they kind of enhance the uh, GABA receptors affinity for the neurotransmitter GABA, but they don't actually go and bind to the receptor itself and activate it like say morphine does uh, to the mu opioid receptors. So they enhance that natural uh, affinity for GABA and in doing so uh, increases the amount of chloride uh, that is uh, brought into the cell which uh, hyperpolarizes it and makes it harder for threshold to be met. Uh, intramuscular or intranasal or IV midazolam is most often used in Australia. In my service, we only use intramuscular and IV, but you'll quite often go to epileptic patients in the community that are prescribed intranasal midazolam, especially children. Midazolam itself has an onset of uh, about 5 to 15 minutes in the intramuscular preparation or about 1 to 5 minutes if it's given intravenously. One of the good things about it compared to other benzos is that it's got quite a short half-life so only lasts about two hours on average if it's given intramuscularly and about just less than two hours if it's given intravenously. Uh, in my service we use a dosage of 100 micrograms a kilo per kilogram intramuscular 
up to a total of about 10 milligrams. Um, or if we've got IV access, we use uh, up to 3 milligram doses of IV midazolam as required. Most textbooks and in hospital um, protocols seem to suggest that lorazepam, um, IV lorazepam, is the benzo of choice. And I think uh, other parts of the world, like the United Kingdom, tend to use diazepam still. Uh, I'm not really sure why there's such a variation in the benzo of choice, but obviously it's quite regional. Um, so comparatively, lorazepam has a similar onset uh, of action um, when compared to midazolam. Its its dosage, uh, sorry, its duration is significantly longer, which is which is good and bad. I suppose if you've given a lot of it, it's you know you you might see the cessation of seizure activity, but then have to deal with a profoundly sedated patient for a lot longer than you would with midazolam. But then at the same time, uh, you're probably less likely to see re the recurrence of seizure activity with the longer half life of Laraz than you would. Uh, with midazolam, and I believe there's some evidence that shows that uh, patients administered midazolam quite obviously seem to have more um, sequential or recurrent episodes of seizures. The dosage of lorazepam is typically 2 to 4 milligrams IV, according to Tintinali. A second line agent, which is something that we're using uh, in South Australia, is a medication called Levetiracetam or Kepra. Uh, which is one of the brand names introduced in 1999. It's a pyrrolidine class medication. Uh, as with so many drugs, again, my little favourite phrase, uh, the exact mechanism remains unknown, but it appears to selectively inhibit hyperpolarised epileptiform burst firing, which would translate to me as being probably blocking that uh, paroxysmal uh, shift that we were talking about earlier. They think it also inhibits voltage-gated uh, um, uh, calcium channels and that it might also um, inhibit the vesicle release at the axon terminals. And remember that the vesicles at the axon terminal contains uh, like little packages of neurotransmitters so in doing so it, re it reduces neurotransmission so in a, in a way it also helps prevent the uh, the propagation or the spread of that seizure activity. The good thing is uh, with levetiracetam is that it's got very few side effects uh, when it's given by itself but it also has very few drug-to-drug -drug interactions which means that it's quite safe to administer in a broad population of patients uh, who are on different medications which is also reassuring if you come across a patient and we don't actually know what medications they're on, so it's, it should be fairly low risk. In terms of uh, the pharmacokinetics and dynamics of the drug, uh, it's got an onset uh, of about one and, a, uh, one and a third hour if it's given orally, uh, and many patients will be prescribed orally if they have got a seizure history. When we're dealing with it, we're probably giving it intravenously. It'll start to work within five to 15 minutes got a duration of effect of about six to eight hours, but in elderly patients or those with renal dysfunction, as it's renally cleared, you might start to see uh, the, the half-life push out to eight to 11 hours. Uh, the, the standard dosage uh, appears to be 20 milligrams per kilogram. We've kind of got a bit of a cap of 2,000 milligrams down here, and that's uh, given over 15 minutes as an IV infusion. Third line agent, which is a drug that we carry but we don't uh, yet use as a anticonvulsant uh, in my service, is ketamine. But having read about how ketamine, or how they think ketamine works, it actually kind of makes a bit of sense. Considering that it's a uh, NMDA receptor antagonist, and we discussed earlier on that NMDA and glutamate uh, being the uh, excitatory neurotransmitters in the nervous system have a reasonable role to play with uh, the propagation of seizures. It kind of makes sense that we should have a drug or use a drug that kind of blocks those receptors. So as we know, ketamine does a, a, a lot of stuff. It mostly interacts with NMDA receptors, but it also plays with opioid receptors, monoaminergic receptors, muscarinic receptors, 
voltage gated uh, calcium channels but also it's important to note that ketamine doesn't uh, interfere with uh, gamma aminobutyric acid or the GABA uh, side of things so it doesn't uh, it doesn't switch off quite like benzos do so one would think they'd probably work pretty well together I don't know um, ketamine the dynamics of that drug onset is really quick about 30 seconds when it's given intravenously but it doesn't last very long only about five to ten minutes uh, the dosage if we're giving a bolus looking at uh, half to four and a half milligrams per kilogram uh, I imagine given how briefly it lasts uh, the bolus dose might not be super effective so more likely to see it used as an infusion at which rate we'd probably give it uh, five milligrams per kilogram per hour now that concludes my presentation on seizures obviously there's a lot more we can go into about seizures we didn't touch on things like absent seizures and focal seizures specifically um, but we did discuss the generalized seizures especially tonic clonic seizures as I said they're the most likely to come across uh, as a paramedic and an, as an intensive care paramedic uh, and also the ones that we've got most of our equipment geared to manage I hope uh, there's something useful in this presentation for you uh, and just like you know so you know that I'm not pulling your leg here's my reference list and that concludes my videos for now thanks <laughs>